Amen. You may be seated. Thank you again, praise team and praise band and our tech team. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you again for this great day. Thank you for the chance to know you today and to walk with you and the chance to fellowship and worship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, with guests today, Lord, and those online. Lord, we pray for our sister church, for First Baptist West Albuquerque, and Pastor Stephen, Pastor Danny, and all of those there, that you just equip them, fill them with your spirit, use them to reach the lost, to make disciples. Lord, we pray for Doug and Cheryl in Thailand, and just pray that you would protect them physically, spiritually, that you would use them to reach many, many Thai for Christ, and that it would spread across that nation and across Asia. And Lord, now we pray for Albuquerque and just pray that you do a tremendous work in our city. God, that your spirit would move in the churches and bring revival and that it would result in spiritual awakening and that you would do a, a great work for your glory here such that only you could get the credit for it. Father, now take your word, continue speaking to me and to us as a body, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Take your copy of God's Word and turn to Revelation chapter 3 today. Revelation chapter 3 will be in the first six verses. Revelation 3, 1 through 6. And we'll be going to Sardis today. And you will understand why I've always been puzzled by churches named Sardis Baptist Church. There actually are, and I know there's a reason and a story, and if I heard it, I'd say, well, that makes sense, but uh, anyway, maybe they're on the upswing from what we'll read today. Well, the Lord just keeps hammering at me as we go through these letters to the seven churches, and uh, so when the Lord finishes working on me, maybe we'll be able to get on to a new subject, but until then, the Lord just keeps pounding His gracious truth uh, he corrects us like a loving parent so that we'll get right with Him, so that we can walk closely with Him, so that He can use us. And so, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, um, it was 1950 in the 1980s that night. Kathy and I were almost married, and we were on a date. We were students at Dallas Baptist University, and they were filming a 50s movie pretty close to our campus, and for some reason, um, it was just open. You could just walk through uh, the street that they were filming on uh, at night. And it was very fascinating to stand there in the street and to look around, and it just it looked like you'd gone back to the 50s, which is before my time, just for the record uh, here. Um, no, I did not barely. <laughs> anyway, so I asked for it. So anyway, there we were, and it, it just, you know, the stores and the shops, it, it looked just like being in the 50s. And of course, as you would imagine, you get closer, and it's all about 18 inches thick, and behind it were uh, run-down stores and just the normal look. And, and that's the way facades are. They look really nice until you want to use them for something. And that's the church at Sardis, of which we read in verses 1 through 6. Jesus says, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things which remain, which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, as always, we look at the background of the city and it tells us a lot about why God would speak and use the kind of phrases and, and uh, the kind of images that he uses. And so here's Sardis. Sardis in the 6th century B.C. was a leading city in Asia. Uh, it was a King Croesus of uh, Lydia. It was his capital there, and they were, they were very, very prominent. 
And uh, they had a lower city and an upper city. We talked about an Acropolis a few weeks ago, but the upper city where the military citadel was built was at the top of a 1,500-foot Acropolis, just a sheer cliff. And it was such that if you tried to climb it, it would shatter. Now, it's eroded now. It's not nearly as high and tall as it was, but it was a wealthy city. They had found gold dust there in the Hermas River. It was one of the earliest places for coinage in history. Uh, It was also, as we'll play into the text here, it was also one of the centers, possibly the origin of the practice of dyeing wool. Well, it was a very powerful city at that time. It had a temple of Artemis where uh, they worshiped a false goddess. The temple, uh, there was an earthquake in AD 17, one of the most catastrophic earthquakes in that time, and the Romans had rebuilt part of the city, but the temple had never been rebuilt all the way. It had 78 grand columns that led up to it, each one 58 feet tall. But the city began to fade. Cyrus of Persia captured the city and became his capital. Alexander the Great of the Greeks captured it, and then later it fell to Antiochus of Rome. Well, like the fading city, the church at Sardis was fading. The church at Sardis was having trouble. As we'll see here, the the Lord doesn't spend much time at all on the positive as He often does in these letters. He just jumps right in because the emergency room doctor, Dr. Jesus, has rushed in to say, you are dying. It is critical. It's not too late, but drastic measures must be carried out for you to live. He says here, reminding them of who He is, I am the one who holds the seven spirits of God, the Holy Spirit, the seven stars of the churches there. And he says here, moving on to not just the background but the problem, he says, I know that you have a name that you're alive but you're dead. Oh, everyone knows you, Church of Sardis. Oh, it must have been an active church that everyone had heard of and everyone knew. Uh, They must have held a prominent public place. In Roman society, he says, you have a name alive, but once you get past the facade, you're spiritually dead. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 7. I'll read you verses 16 to 23. He says, you'll know them by their, not facade, but their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every tree, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And Jesus elsewhere told us that the will of God, the, the, the first part, the main entrance to doing the will of God was to believe that Jesus was the Son of God, that Jesus is our Savior. Having faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, and then continuing to follow Him, that bears fruit. It's not the fruit that saves us. It's not the result of our spiritual life that makes us right with God and going to heaven. But it happens when the Holy Spirit is living in us and we're yielding to the Spirit. And he says there are going to be some that are going to come and they're going to say, we were so religious. We were so busy at church. We did this and we did that. And he's going to say, I'm sorry. I never knew you. So first and foremost today, because just as Jesus is speaking to two groups at the church of Sardis, one of those groups is is a group that didn't even know him as Savior, even though they were somehow in the church. Be sure you know Christ as your Savior. Whether you're in this room or watching online, be sure you nail this down today. Don't put it off. We don't know how long we'll be here. And it's not even that we care about it being done before we die because eternal life begins when you come to know Christ. So you're not only missing out for eternity if you don't know Christ, you're missing out here. Deal with that today. We'll be here in a few moments at the invitation time for you to come or for those online for you to reach out to us so we can make sure you know Christ as Savior. But believer, are you alive 
or are you dead? I'm not talking about do you know Christ as Savior? Once my children become my children, they'll always be my children. If you've come to know Christ authentically, you've been born again, the Spirit of God has come to live inside of you. Yes, you'll be His forever, but you can still be spiritually dead. You can be walking around as the model Christian in your neighborhood, in our church, but behind the facade, there may be nothing there anymore. Are you alive or are you dead? Are you in the Word? Are you in prayer? Are you with God? You say, I, you know, I, I'm not close to my spouse. Well, do you ever talk? Well, no, we're too busy. Well, bingo. I'm not close to God. Are you spending time with Him? Well, not really. Well, bingo. Do you wake up in the morning and it's already decided that you're going to spend time with God? I'm not saying you've, you've never missed a day. I'm just saying that you don't wake up and decide whether you're going to eat. As believers, it needs to be a done deal. I'm going to do whatever it takes tomorrow. I'm going to spend time with God. I'm going to be in His Word. I'm going to be in prayer and not just a prayer as I fly out the door. I say morning. That's when Jesus spent His dedicated time with the Lord and other times throughout the day. Of course, there are situations where morning's impossible, uh, but I, I recommend it. You're getting ready for the day at that time, are you fellowshipping with God? Are then you trying to make decisions throughout the day that reflect that? But we aren't perfect. We're, we'll still sin until we get to heaven's gates. Plan A is that we let our time with God affect our day so that we're following Him. But because we don't all the time, we think thoughts that aren't right. We have words that aren't right. We have actions that are not right. Attitudes, ooh, that one hurts, doesn't it? Even our attitudes, why we're doing it. So plan B is when the Holy Spirit, if He lives inside of you, He'll immediately convict you of it. I hope He's convicting you because He sure is convicting me all day long. So I hope I'm not the only one getting it. But He will convict us, so plan B is to deal with it, to keep short accounts with God. You're right, Lord. Thank you that the cross pays for that. Help me. Help me to, to turn and follow you in that area. The devil wants to defeat you in it. The devil wants to lie to you and tell you you're a lousy believer or to tell you you can't become a believer. No, that's, that's what the cross did. It paid for all of it. But we want to walk in fellowship with him. We want when Jesus gets behind the facade for Jesus to say, yeah, you're not perfect. No one is. But you're alive. You're walking with me. You're keeping short accounts with me. You're telling others about me. When's the last time we told anybody about Christ? Anybody about church, Christ, prayer, just, just something. You'd be surprised if you just launch out there. Hey, how can I pray for you? Very few people are offended when you offer to pray for them. How can I pray for you? Hey, where do you go to church? Has anybody ever told you about how much God loves you? Set the goal for one this week. One. The devil says, oh, it's too much. You can't share with 100 people this week, so don't do any. Share with one. Something. If the Lord allows it to go somewhere to a full explanation of the gospel, great. But if not, you've still caused someone to go home thinking that Christ must be important to you. Uh, these are some of these evidences of, of us being alive. The life happens on the inside, you and, and God, me and God. But there are these evidences. May it never be said about you, about me, about our church, that we have a name of being alive but that we're dead. Sandia Baptist Church has been privileged over these decades to be a leading church in the Southern Baptist work here in New Mexico. It's a privilege that we have, but may it always be true that we're not just busy doing good for the convention, but that we're alive, that we really are walking freshly with God. A friend of ours told us about a buffet years ago, and man, man, by the sound of it, this was going to be the best meal we'd ever eaten. And uh, we couldn't wait to, to get there, but our friend had been there too many times. And you know, when you get used to something, you don't see things anymore, and you don't you know what's happening. Uh, that buffet had died a long time ago. The food wasn't very good, it wasn't presentable, and to make matters worse, when you walk from your booth over to the buffet, you could hear the of your feet sticking to the floor, you know? I don't like to eat in dirty places, I don't know about you. No, that, that place had died a long time ago. Today, if nothing else, let the Lord just talk with you about where you're at with Him. I'm not trying to pronounce you dead at all because you're not, but if there's a deadness in your spiritual walk, just let the Lord deal with you about that. He does that so we can deal with it. He already paid for it. And so we can just all day long, when He reminds us, you're right, Lord, I'm sorry. Thank you for paying for that on the cross. Help me to choose to follow you in this area. 
Are we alive or are we dead? Well, he gives us five commands here. Don't get lost in the, in the, in the number that there's five. There's five imperatives here, and we want to take note of what he said to do about these things. He says in verse 2, wake up or be watchful, your version may say. Watch, be alert. You see, the devil is, roars about like a, a, a prowling lion. He's seeking us to devour. He wants to keep you from coming to know Christ. That's his first goal for you. Isn't he a wonderful enemy? He wants to keep you from coming to know Christ. He does everything he can to cause people to doubt putting their faith in Christ. But if he loses that battle, then he switches to plan B, and that's to keep you from walking with Christ so that you won't live the joy of the Christian life, so you won't be a useful vessel for whom God can work. And so he's working against us, and the Lord says, wake up, be watchful. I'll tell you about one in a moment, but there were two times, you see, it was considered impossible to penetrate the upper city of Sardis, but it really should have been called almost impossible because there were two times in history. And so God speaking to them again, they would understand this, wake up, don't let your guard down, be watchful. Are you praying about the weak parts of your Christian life? Are you just doing the same thing every day and wondering why you're getting the same result? That's called insanity, to do the same thing every day and expect different results. Are we praying about these things? Are we putting the Scripture into our heart, memorizing Scripture, meditating on Scripture, praying through the Scripture, having our time with God and saying, okay, what did you say to me today, God, from this Word? Wake up. Be watchful. Let the Lord lead you. And he says, strengthen the things that remain. Strengthen the things, he says, that were about to die because I haven't found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. And again, this allusion to the city that had been partially rebuilt. Strengthen those things. We know those things. If you look back at the beginning of your Christian life, you say, oh, that was the time when I was fresh with God. That was the time that I was excited to be in the Word. That was the time I was excited to pray. To pray. That was the time I was excited to tell others about Christ. Well, the first time I led someone to Christ in high school and they, they came to believe in Christ, I did cartwheels. Now, again, I was a little younger. Uh, that wouldn't be a good idea these days. Uh, you'd have to come visit me in the hospital. But still, the joy, if you look back and it's all past tense, let God help you strengthen the things today. Strengthen your, your desire. God, burn in me a new desire. Revive my heart that I would want to be with you. That I'd want to praise you, not just in the morning, but throughout my day. God, will you help me to strengthen those things? But he goes on, he says also, remember. Remember. Remember how you received them, or that you received them, what you received over here in verse 3. Remember what you received. Remember how, your version may say, you have received them. God, restore, renew that early joy in my Christian life so that my latter days will be as good or better than my early days. Oh, don't be those believers who eventually just say, oh, I, I don't need to grow in the Lord anymore. I just, I, I did that. I was, I was strong with the Lord, and now I'm just going to be just, a, just kind of a grumpy old Christian. That's, that's going to be my role. And uh, yeah, whatever. No, be that one that to your dying day is still growing. Christ. Oh, that we may be those. Remember, he says, and then keep it or obey it and repent. Repentance again is your friend. Repentance is you responding to the wonderful grace of God as a loving father as he comes to you and says, you need to get right with me about this. And the devil says, oh, just push it off. Deal with that later. And God says, I'm going to be back with you on this again tomorrow. I already know it. So just repent of it. Just say, God, you're right. Thank you for the cross. Help me to make a U-turn and repent and begin again to obey and to keep your word. Oh, just, just let God deal with us today. If nothing else, just a time out of your busy week to just pause and say, God, where are we at? Where are we at in our relationship? I'll read you something that is painful, but it's good in this process of just of doing evaluation with God about are we dead? Are we alive? Are there dead spots? 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5, Paul's writing to Timothy, and you might want to pull your toes in a little bit here. Um, there's, it's a long list of places we don't want to find ourselves, but we need to think through these things with God. God. Paul says, but realize that in the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, 
boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, disobedient to parents. My kids are in here, so I just want to say that a few times. Because all the rest of the list is painful for me. Ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable. What that, that's God saying that's, that's on the not good list. Well, you don't know what they did to me. God knows what they did to you. Boy, in my reading this week, I'm, I'm doing the chronological Bible this year for the first time, so you get the same thing sometimes multiple times. If in, I'm in the Gospels, and just looking at what Jesus went through again afresh. You know, we, I, have, you know I have these fears about what it will mean to be a Christian in the, in the future, and I'm reading about Jesus, and I'm thinking, so what? Look what he did for me, and he didn't deserve it. But anyway, so this stuff's important to God. Malicious gossips? Ooh. Is it a prayer request or is it gossip? Without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness on the outside, although they've denied the power thereof. Wow. Just again, just, just letting God show us where there are places where we're, we're, we're not enjoying the Christian life to the fullest because we keep putting God off in these ways. I'm not trying to pronounce them on you, just trying to lead you through this process of doing evaluation with God so that we, the church, Scripture says, let revival begin in the house of God. We, we want the world to get right, and they don't know Christ. We've got to get right first, either in a big way or in these dead spots that may be in our Christian life and letting God identify them. Wake up, strengthen, remember, keep it, repent. And then he says, if you don't, I'll come like a thief, and you'll not know at what hour I will come. It was 547 B.C. in King Croesus of Lydia. This was still his capital. And so the oracle at Delphi had, in this false god way, pronounced that if he would attack the king of Persia, Cyrus, that a great kingdom would end. Well, uh, there was a half truth there because a great kingdom ended, but it was not the kingdom he thought. He attacked the king of Persia, and they had a battle, but there was no decisive victory. And so the custom was that then you would go back and you would rest through the winter, and then you would go back out as the kings would go out to war. Well, the only problem was King Cyrus broke the custom, and he didn't rest in the winter. So King Croesus and his army went back to the upper citadel there in Sardis, thinking, we're good. Nobody can get up here. We don't even have to keep watch. Well, the Persian army was down below trying to find a way to get up that Acropolis. And there was one Persian soldier, and he was watching. And he saw in the distance, looking up that 1,500 feet rise, he saw something drop. There was a soldier of Sardis that had dropped his helmet. And so the Persian soldier watched him to see the only way down that Acropolis and the only way back up. And the Persian army was able to take that route and to attack suddenly without notice because the Sardans were not protecting themselves. And that was the end of Lydia at Sardis and the beginning of King Cyrus' reign of Persia. And so they would know what Jesus was talking about. He says, I'll come like a thief in the night if you don't take care of this. But there's a wonderful promise for those who would overcome. He's speaking to many in the church at Sardis that don't know Christ, and they've snuck in. And He says, you need to get right. You're dying and you're already dead. But he's also speaking, he says, there's a remnant. There are a few who haven't soiled your garments. And again, they would understand this. That's where they dyed wool. Now, all through the Old Testament, you couldn't go to the temple if your garments were soiled. They understood this imagery. He said, there's some of you who've not gone over. You've not become spiritually dead. And I want to tell you, he says, if you will overcome, not in your own strength, we sang about it today, we overcome by the Spirit of God. We yield to the Spirit of God. He works in us. We overcome. Revelation 12, 11. The, 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 the enemy accusing day and night, it says, but they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives even unto death. He says, if you overcome, there are three things that he would do. One, he says, you'll walk in the white garments 
We don't make our garments white. Over in Isaiah, he makes us the promise. He says, come, let us reason. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be white as snow, and they'll be like white wool. He is the one through the cross of Christ that makes us white. He says, you'll walk in the white garments. He says, I will not erase your name from the book of life. Now, if you've come to know Christ, your name can't be erased from the book of life, but it's a double negative here. He's just trying to give emphasis to say, I'm telling you, if you, in the face of all that you have there in this world around you, if you, by the power of the Spirit, will overcome, will stay with me, I will by no means erase your name from the book of life. And then he says, and I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. We see the painful opposite of this there in Peter's story, which I read this week. Jesus said to the disciples that night when he was going to be arrested, you'll all fall away from me. For that moment, you'll have a spiritual death in your life because you'll say that you don't know me. And Peter, as he always did in his let's take this hill mentality, he said, I'll never deny you. And Jesus said, I'm sorry, Peter, three times tonight before the cock cock crows, you will. And just as he denied Jesus that third time, as you remember, the cock did crow, the rooster did crow. And how agonizing it was for Peter. Didn't lose his salvation, didn't mean that he didn't know Christ, but he went through agony. Jesus forgave him because of the cross. But Jesus says, when you overcome, he says, I know I know your deeds, I know your location, I know your setting, I know what you're having to deal with, but if you'll yield to the Spirit, if you'll keep working daily to to stay alive with me, I'll be up there, I'll be talking to the Father about you. I'll be saying, hey, look, God, look at them, look at Joe, look at Sue, look what they're doing today to stay spiritually alive. Look at Sandy Baptist Church, God. They're working, they're not perfect, but they're working to say, what's the word say and where do we not line up? And they want to stay fresh. They want to be people of prayer. They want to stay alive and be useful for Christ. Where are you today? If you don't know Christ as Savior here online, deal with it today. And then believers, is there something? Are there a couple of things? The devil will come in with 15 things to overwhelm you, but the Lord will usually lay one or two things on your heart. Could you deal with those with God today and say, oh God, you're right. Thank you for paying for that. I just want to have my account short with you. I want to be deeply close to you today. I repent of that. Help me today. And if I fail again tomorrow on that, I'm going to keep short accounts with you because the cross helped me to get back up and keep plugging away and keep finding how can I let the Spirit of God work in me so that I can follow you in this area. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word to me this week. Lord, help us as individuals, as families, and as a church to be alive Oh, Father, those places that you've identified in our lives today where there's some spiritual deadness, help us to just be honest with you, admit it, repent, be thankful for the cross, and do the things, strengthen the things, remember the things that cause us to grow and be alive spiritually. Oh, God, I pray for the glorious future of this church as we seek to continue to humbly imperfectly follow after you. Oh, God, make us more alive than ever before. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.